Uh, my name's Robin Green. I was uh, born in Adelaide, South Australia, and I went to Rwanda, uh, Unimir 2, Contingent 2, as a nursing officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. I came from a military family. My father was um, an Air Force uh, rad tech and uh, he was posted to Woomera, uh, asked for a posting north, expecting to go to Malta and he got Woomera, uh, which is in that far north of, uh, of Adelaide. Uh, my mother went with him and uh, she worked out on cameras out, at, uh, out in the Donga. Uh, filming all of the rockets that would be launched with the American um, British uh, rocket program that was out there back then. So this was late uh, 50s. I was born in 1960. Um, and so I grew up in this, this family that was always involved in Air Force Association. So I, I didn't really have a hope. So. Uh, I used to help Dad on um, Anzac Day. We would get up and we would go to uh, dawn service and then uh, go home, have breakfast, and then go in and work with him all day, selling raffle tickets, picking up uh, uh, beer glasses, selling sandwiches into the wee small hours of the night. So for me, um, the military and things that happened with the military was always about service and it was always about giving and giving back. I ended up being born at Elizabeth. Uh, my mother was, when she was pregnant with me, uh, wasn't going to be able to have me in Woomera. And uh, so my dad got a posting down south to Edinburgh. We moved down there and Dad worked at, um, with the Air Force and then he transferred to weapons research, uh, doing exactly the same job. So when he finished his time in the Air Force, went to weapons research, so he stayed um, uh, out at Salisbury for his whole entire career. And um, I say that because we got shifted into town into a, a government house, a little red brick home, which we are selling at the moment. Finally, after all of these years, nearly 60 years of uh, living in that house, the, the house is finally being sort of sold off now that my uh, father has passed away. But um, that house was always full of um, lots of good memories and people always to do with Air Force and Air Force Association. So when I, I went nursing, uh, because that seemed like a really good job to do in the military. So all through high school, I knew I was going to get into the military. And it was just a matter of deciding which service to go to. So a girlfriend of mine and I decided that uh, we looked at all the brochures when we were in fourth year high and we thought, oh, there's all these pictures of people playing tennis in the Air Force. So we thought, Air Force is the way to go, which suited my, my parents very well. And, um, and so that was my plan. So we went nursing uh, and I met a, uh, uh, an Australian rules footballer and uh, he wanted to get married and I said, well, that's okay, I'll get married, but the proviso is I joined the Air Force. After I finish my nursing training, I do 12 months Air Force, and he agreed to that. And um, unfortunately, when it came to that time of bringing my paperwork home and having to get it signed, and back then you had to join within a certain time. Um, you, uh, I think it was like 22 or 23 years of age. And if I wasn't in by then, I couldn't join. Well, things have dramatically changed, of course, uh, nowadays. but. Um, I brought my paperwork home and I uh, said, you know, uh, here's my paperwork, I'm going to join the Air Force and we're going to be travelling. And he went, no, you can't join the Air Force. He said, I'm a fitter and turner now at General Motors Holden and I've, my football career is taking off, so you can't join. And I thought, well, no, that wasn't the deal. I agreed to get married so long as I joined the Air Force. 
And I remember ringing my parents, and my parents always brought me up to be a very strong female that could think for myself. And I was bitterly disappointed in both of them because my father said, well, you're a wife now and your husband has to take the lead. And I'm thinking, what? That was not what you told me when I was growing up. And I rang my mum and she said virtually the same thing. And I thought, what the heck is going on? Anyway, so I didn't join and I was just getting really miserable. And I ran into, I used to, um, uh, judge gymnastics as well. So I met a girl uh, at a competition one time. She was a coach of another club and she was telling me how she just joined the Army Reserve and how much fun it was and how, well, it was a good outlet for her because she was coaching gymnastics so much. The Army Reserve was really good and I started to think, well, the reserves, that'd be all right. So I investigated quietly without telling anybody um, Army and Air Force Reserves. And the Air Force, I was a registered nurse, I uh, was an operating room nurse at that stage and um, I was in my mid-twenties and I'm thinking, okay, well, I, I don't necessarily want to be a nurse in the reserves. So I went out to the Air Force and they offered me a uh, position as a um, uh, sort of like an intelligence, an, an OPSO, operations officer, um, that did briefings for air crew and that kind of thing. And they were all reserve positions back in those days. So I thought, yeah, that sounded okay. Well, I went out to the, I went into the army and I spoke to them. And I was in and I was having this interview and the guy said, and what do you want to do? And I said, I want to carry a radio on my back and I want to sort of get out there in the field. And this was going really well. And, and as we were talking, he sort of said, well, you know, he said, you do that for a few years and then we'll put you through OCTU and the officer training course for the army. And, and I thought, oh yeah, I didn't really need that because my job, I had a lot of responsibility. I ran my operating theatre and stuff. And I thought, no, 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 this will be great, fun. And, um, and then he said, oh, well, what do you do for a job? And I said, well, I'm a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the operating theatre. And he got up and left the room. And I thought, OK, maybe I've said something wrong. And he came back and he said, I've just rung the, um, the hospital at Warradale and uh, they're there tonight. Uh, you need to go down there and talk to them. I said, well, I don't want to be a nurse. And so anyway, I got in my car and down I went. And... They were um, in desperate need of some more operating room staff because they had been given the task of setting up the reserve parachute surgical team. And uh, so they said, look, you know, you've got to come in to the reserve here with us at the hospital, so 3 Forward General Hospital. So I thought, yeah, OK, they seem to want me. So went through recruiting, joined up. I even started working with them before I was getting paid. I'd turn up, no rank, no nothing, just in uniform and stuff that they managed to get me um, before everything was all finalised because they were so desperate they needed people to help get this program off the ground. Although they did have theatre nurses, so I wasn't always sure quite why, but off I went. And my job was to set up the anaesthetics uh, anaesthetic department for them. So I did that and um, and I remember when I joined the Army Reserve and I rang Dad and I said, oh Dad, I'm in the Army Reserve. And he just said, no, Air Force or nothing. And he wouldn't speak to me. And I thought, oh my goodness. So my grandfather rang me and he said, I understand your father's not talking to you. I said, yeah, he's really not very happy. He said he'll get over it. And my grandfathers were both ex-army men and uh, one had been to Kokoda and the other one was a uh, uh, light horse uh, that turned into cavalry after they were no longer taking horses. And uh, he was in, uh, in Egypt and he was a man that could sit and talk for hours. And I used to love listening to all his, uh, his stories of, of when he was in the war. The other grandfather never said anything about it. Um, I guess Kokoda was a little bit of a different experience. But um, he said, look, you're the only daughter, your dad loves you, don't worry, he'll, uh, uh, he'll speak to you in a week's time. And that's what, what happened and it was all fine. 
But I was with the Armour Reserve from 86 to 91 and I, uh, funnily enough, ended up divorcing my first husband and uh, I met a chap that was in the Navy and, uh, and I was still Army Reserve and I was doing work in Darwin and uh, he got posted to WA and I got a job down there in recruiting and uh, recruiting used to hate it when I would go with them to the uh, universities when we were talking to um, the university students to get them to become undergrads for us and uh, so that's where they pay for your training. Um, you still go through university and then you give your time back to the services after. Anyway, I used to talk to people and go, because I had been in the army, uh, I was about to transfer to the Air Force and my husband was Navy, or my partner at the time was Navy. Um, I could talk to someone, find out what their interests were and go, okay, go and talk to this person or go and talk to that person. And Air, uh, Army would go, well, you're not helping our recruiting numbers. And I said, well, if you're going to spend money on people, get them to go to the service, we'll keep them in. So that was always my, I was always tri-service back then. Anyway, so um, I he decided to transfer from the Navy to the Air Force and become an air traffic controller. And he said, look, you always wanted to be Air Force. You, you're working sort of virtually two jobs. I was working almost full time for Army recruiting uh, and also my job as a nurse. So he said, why don't you just come along and join the Air Force full time as well? So I did, I transferred to the Air Force. And the Air Force were very happy to get me because they were just rolling out this thing called a FAST and it was a forward air surgical team. And what it really was, was this big wooden box that rolled off the back of an aircraft with doctors, nurses and medics. And it was a portable operating theatre that could work for 24 hours on the side of an airfield. But they didn't have anyone to take it out, field and test it. Um, and so for some reason, because of my experience in the army with the parachute surgical, reserve parachute surgical team, they um, thought, yep, yeah, she needs to come in. We need her, we want her expertise. We want to send her out with this thing. So um, it, it was great. I sort of went into the Air Force and people seemed to know my name and uh, I was a, a flying officer that was being sent out with this expensive bit of kit after I did my officer training course um, and I became really in the Air Force uh, an operating room specialist. Um, so from there, uh, once I came back with, with that piece of kit, did all of my courses and was working in operating rooms. So at Six Hospital at Laverton, then they sent me to Edinburgh where I um, actually opened up the operating theatre uh, there. Um, they had a lovely day surgery sort of theatre. And uh, I used to get phone calls from the builders when I was working at Laverton, uh, which is in Victoria, knowing I was going to be posted to Edinburgh so that we could commission this thing. What colour paint do you want on the walls? I don't know, what colour paint can I have? Um, so it was a little bit of fun and so I went there, we opened up this operating theatre and I went off to do a course, a trauma nurse course and uh, Rwanda had just started and um, one of the guys I worked with potted off to Rwanda and we didn't know anything about Rwanda. Uh, and we sort of thought he'd gone off to some African country for a bit of a holiday as a nurse. He was one of our fellow nurses. So we'd write letters and we'd talk to him and um, didn't really know an awful lot about it. While I was doing this trauma course, uh, a couple of the girls on the course got phone calls from our posters saying that they're being posted to Rwanda uh, for the next rotation. And I went, well, I want to go. So I rang our poster and he said, well, you're an operating room nurse. They never want to go anywhere. I went, well, I want to go. And he went, well, you can go. So I went back into the course and went, I'm going. And um, none of us had any idea what we were going to, why we were really going or anything about it. So we all went home, told our families, had a whole bunch of injections, um, learnt a little bit, I guess, and before we knew it, we were 
all in Townsville doing this two-week course together, Army, Navy, Air Force, and the infantry was sent off in one area and all the support people were sent off here, all the medical people, 108 of us or 110 of us, were all together. Then we suddenly found out a little bit about what was going on, that there'd been these massacres over there, um, Australia was sending over health teams. The, the little bit of background in this is that the, the US had been in and out of all kinds of conflict at this time and they had decided when Rwanda happened, like they should have got in there earlier. So the Canadians had been on the ground and they had been telling the UN uh, for quite a while that things were really unstable and they were very concerned that something bad was going to happen. They weren't given a mandate to do anything about it if anything bad did happen. Um, the UN was sort of sitting on their laurels and sort of hoping that the whole problem would go away. Anyway, so when the massacre, when the plane crash happened that killed the president of Burundi and um, Rwanda, that set everything in motion. And the Americans said, well, we're not throwing forces in there. The UN have to put pressure on African countries to start solving African issues. So there were a whole lot of African countries that went in to try and help sort out what was happening in Rwanda. And the bottom line was it, it really wasn't working. Um, in Rwanda, a little bit of background about Rwanda. There are three groups of people that live in Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis. Both of those groups of people were foreigners. One came from the south and one came from the north. And over a hundred years earlier, they ended up in Rwanda and they were Rwandan Hutus, Rwandan Tutsis. The real Rwandans were actually pygmies. They're, they were the Twa. Um, little short people, lovely people. Uh, they were either farmers or forest people. Um, there seemed to be a few different tribes of them and they really didn't, they did their own thing. So the Hutus and the Tutsis come in and they've been fighting for a hundred years. Um, the Tutsis originally were usually tall, thin people. They tended to have education. They tended to be the people that ruled on and off in Rwanda. Um, but they were a minority. The Hutu were shorter, more stubby people. They ran the, the farms. They had the properties, and uh, but there were a lot more of them. So Rwanda came under the jurisdiction of the Belgians. So when you look at colonisation, the Belgians and the French had a lot to do with Rwanda. So the Tutsis were saying to the Belgians, look, we are, you're taking all our profits, you know, you want, you want all this money, you want all this good stuff, but our country needs to grow with our produce and, and with what uh, we're earning. And, and if you look at Rwanda as a country at this stage, they were, they were almost pure communism in the real true sense of the word in the fact that they they didn't import much, they exported everything. And their communities were very, um, they were all, you would have family groups that lived in a community together and they would have a mayor. And the mayor knew everybody. He would have a photograph of everybody in his community. His community grew or manufactured stuff. Then there's a community over here they would trade with that community and then they would all trade with each other. Then there would be leftover stuff in the middle that would then go to another group, like off to a big market, and they would buy in things that they didn't have. So there wasn't money necessarily changing hands, it was goods and services. So the country worked really well and the Tutsis and the Hutus, they all lived there together quite happily, merrily. But this set them up for massive disaster. And so the Tutsis were telling the Belgians, go away, we don't want to supply you with money and goods anymore. Um, and the Belgians were a bit angry about this. 
and they started getting the Hutus rallied up and saying, well, you're the majority. Tutsi shouldn't be in government. You should be in government. This is a very simplified, I guess, version of it, but it runs along this uh, sort of line. And then the Twa were just ignored. So, um, so the Belgians actually armed the, uh, the Hutus and a few years earlier, the Belgians actually wanted you to either be Tutsi or Hutu. And if you really didn't know what you were or who you were, because families have been interbreeding forever, um, they told you what you were. And it was stamped on your photograph card. So your um, mayor said, well, you're actually Hutu, you're Tutsi, and who really knows who anybody was, you know? Some people, just because the size of their nose, how broad their nose was, made them a Hutu, or you've got height, so you're a Tutsi. So, a little while later, um, you know, the Belgians are sort of going, well, you know, we got to destabilise this a little bit. And they armed the Hutu, they came in and really they antagonised the situation to the point where it turned into a massive genocide. And at a particular time, the Hutus were all supposed to take out the Tutsis and all the mayors knew who had to take out who, who had to be um, eliminated from their groups and uh, and so that the Belgians didn't have it look like they really had anything much to do with it they armed rebels from all over the place and they were called the Intraharmway they came into Rwanda and when they were given a sig signal they were just to go out and mass kill anybody just to cause trauma drama and to make the blame look like it wasn't, um, it wasn't actually the Belgians doing, Belgium and the French. So the Canadians could see what was happening, that there was stuff brewing, um, they'd been leaked a bit of information, the UN weren't having a bar of it, and then all of a sudden the plane crashes, that's the message all hell breaks loose in Rwanda and somewhere between 500,000 and a million people in a very short space of time were just massacred. So all of a sudden then the UN sort of going, heck, we need to put people in there. So they were hitting up every country to try and get people in there. So the African countries were the first ones. They jumped in, um, they were trying to do the best that they could, uh, but there was a lot of mixed feelings with them because their countries were set up, they were still, they'd all been colonised as well and by some French, by some of the Belgians, it was a little bit of a mixed bag for them. Uh, and the UN kept hitting Australia and going, look, you know, you're not doing enough for the UN, so uh, we really need you to send peacekeepers, send peacekeepers, and Australia said, no, no, no. But eventually they said, look, what we will do is send health teams. So they decided to send health teams, but our job was to look after the UN forces on the ground. But Australia didn't trust anybody. They didn't trust the African forces to look after the Australians. So they said, well, if we're sending, you know, a hundred odd medical people, which really don't know how to shoot for hell, um, we need to send infantry to look after them. And then if you send 100 odd infantry people, you need to feed everybody, you need to pay everybody, you need to et cetera, et cetera. So another 100 odd people got sent as well. So we had mechanics, we had truck drivers, we had um, engineers and all kinds of people that went. So it ended up, I think the first group was about 350 and I think our rotation was about 310 that went over. Now the first contingent that went over, the two contingents were entirely different. Uh, the first lot that went over, there was still war happening. So after this massacre happened, you had on the border of Zaire um, an army 
of virtually tootsies that had been run out of the country years earlier. And some of the people, some of the, the military officers that they had, had even come to, gone to England and done um, officer training, come to Australia. They had been westernised with their um, thinking and tactics and stuff. So they started moving in. So they uh, mobilised from Zaire and they were coming in and they were trying to work as a bit of a clearing force, cleaning force, getting then rid of the Hutus. So this massacre, this genocide just kept going on and on and on. So we had the original and then you also had um, this tracking of people in. So the Australians sort of hit the ground at about the same time this army force hit Kigali. And um, so it was very unstable, very unsafe. And Australians were told, you're going in as peacekeepers, um, medical people, and uh, the infantry are there to look after you. But the job just for them was held because there was no hospital set up. Uh, the infantry were having to go out and bring healthcare workers from their homes to Central Hospital Kigali, and that was local people. And at the time when the massacres happened, if you were an educated person, you were being slaughtered. So Rwanda had an amazing medical school, nursing education programs, you know, physiotherapies, pathologists, they trained everybody. They had their own schools of medicine and nursing and these were just destroyed. And you know, professors, heads of department went around just killing doctors and nurses and anyone that was educated. Um, so the staff that were still there were very terrified of coming in and they didn't know who to trust. They didn't know if they would be next on a hit list of people to be killed. And um, I, I'd had a conversation with a lovely uh, young infantry soldier uh, from back then, um, Miles, Miles Wooten. Uh, he'll tell you the stories of every day going out to these nurses' homes and picking them up to bring them back into Central Hospital Kigali and having um, having to go through all these checkpoints and every morning just having AK-47s pointed at his heads by these guards um, and trying to convince the women in his car to talk to these guards to let them know what he was doing because we didn't, you know, they didn't know any of the language at that time. So, and they were being very scared to do that. So, um, so that first, that whole first group that went over, you know, they, they were given this accommodation block where everyone that had been in there had been slaughtered. So they had walked into rooms in Rwanda with still with body parts and bits in their bedroom. So before they could even move in to this, uh, and it was a military accommodation block, and before they could move in there and live, they were having to wash bits out of their rooms. So these are day one, day two. No one knew any of this was going to happen. And um, so, you know, they really hit the ground running. They had to set up a hospital. They had to set up perimeters. They didn't really know, um, well, they didn't know how they were going to get out of there if there was a problem. If all of a sudden somebody was going to turn weapons in on the Australian compound, who was going to come and help us? How long could we last? Um, and this was all the things that the first contingent had to deal with and their, uh, the hierarchy that were there. So there was a lot of um, strictness about things that happened um, because no one was sure. Day to day it was so fluid for a lot of them that uh, um, things just changed constantly. Things started to stabilise out a bit. Uh, and then when they got into Kigali, they renamed themselves the, uh, uh, the RPA, the Rwandan Patriotic Army, and they took control. Now we happened to be embedded right next door to them. So their headquarters was there. We were here. The hospital that most of us worked at was down here. So by the time we got there, things had stabilised out a lot more. Um, there wasn't the ongoing battles 
quite as much going on. It was still very unstable, very unsafe, but things had settled, processes, supply chains had been set up, so we were starting to get stuff in. They weren't on rat packs anymore, they were actually having food cooked for them. Um, and things very much changed so that when we were leaving, uh, when we, would, we got these talks, if we go back to Townsville before we left, there was a lot more intel, there was a lot more, we had doctors coming and talking to us about what the experience was going to be like because they'd already been over there and done six weeks over and had come back and could tell us all of this stuff. So we went over there with our eyes a little bit um, more open than the first group did. And I remember one of the things that happened was a doctor showing a video. He had this video of travelling from the airport to the barracks and he showed us the road all the way down and we sat there and we watched this thing and, and he said, and they'll take pot shots at your vehicles as you're travelling along. And I thought, oh, that's nice, isn't it? But he said, don't worry, you'll be there during the day. It's fine, they, they won't take too many shots at you during the day. So, we're heading over to Rwanda, about to jump on the plane, and Qantas has our plane grounded. The plane is Tower Air, number five jumbo ever to come off the, the line. And this plane was a charter, and the plane was normally used to take Jewish people on pilgrimages. So to go into different countries, pick up all these Jewish people, take them to, it's not Mecca, but take them to um, uh, Israel to do their thing. So uh, very old aircraft and Qantas were annoyed that they didn't get the charter to take us over. So they, this plane was grounded. So this set us back over 24 hours and it was actually more like 36 hours because all of our stuff was loaded on the plane and they decided, well, we couldn't hang around the airport any longer. So they took us back to the barracks, threw a few um, mattresses on the ground. We all slept there in the same clothes, got up the next day in the same clothes and boarded this aircraft. What that meant was that we were actually arriving in Rwanda um, at almost the same time the other guys should have been leaving and at night time. So there we are, we get off this plane in this uh, airport that is just totally shot up. We get in these trucks and they load us in these trucks and they load us back to back so we're looking out of the truck at the side. Sides are all rolled up. It's now night time and I'm thinking, shit, these guys take pot shots at you at night time. And I'm thinking, this is great. And I turned around and I looked at the infantry soldier that was in the truck with us. He had a weapon but no magazine. And I said to the guy, oi, where's your magazine? He said, oh no, we've had to hand them all in um, because we're leaving, so everything had to be accounted for. They gave us some weapons so we looked like we could look after you. Or protect you, I think was the word. And I just went, oh my God, and I put my head in my hand, in my lap, and went, I'm gonna die. And that was my first experience in Rwanda. And I don't think I really shook that feeling the whole time that I was there, to be perfectly honest. I just thought, what the hell have I stepped into? Anyway, so we, we rock up and uh, we all knew what our jobs were and I was supposed to be working on the ward. I wasn't in the operating theatre and that was fine. I was supposed to be on the ward. And they called out all the bosses' names, all the people that were going to be in charge of things, and they said, at this time, there's a meeting that you've got to go to. So we were going to get a, they were going to get about four hours sleep. The rest of us were all having the day off. So I start reading out this list, and my name gets called out. And I'm thinking, I'm not a boss. And everyone's looking at me, and I went, that was my name, wasn't it? And they're going, yeah, what's your name being called out for? I don't know. Anyway, while we had been in Townsville, gobby mouth here, um, had a bit of a dummy spit one day and sort of said, oh, I'm not going all the way to bloody Rwanda just to look after UN troops. I can look after military people any day. You know, we should be looking after locals. So um, anyway, so I had my dummy spit and that it was all over and done with. Well, unfortunately, the two majors heard that, the senior nursing officer and the doctor heard that. And when the doctor went on the advance party, um, the first contingent had started sending people over to Central Hospital Kigali and they had been given 
wards to look at, help look after. They'd only been there for six weeks because it was only safe enough for that amount of time. So all of a sudden now, part of our contingent was going to be working in Central Hospital Kigali. And they thought, yeah, we know who we're going to send. And the, I slept for three hours and got up because my name had been called out. I was none too happy. And I went over with everybody else to this meeting. And I'm standing there while everyone's introduced to their person that they've got to do handover, takeover. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm the last one left in the room. And the two majors, Major Brandy and Major Wheatley, just look at me and start smiling. And I went, what's going on, ma'am, sir? And they said, well, you got your wish. And I went, my wish? What was my wish? And they said, you're heading up a team that's going to be working in Central Hospital Kigali. And I thought, you bloody beauty. And, um, and I had a flight lieutenant, a flying officer, no, sorry, a lieutenant army nurse, uh, Belinda, um, a corporal uh, that was a theatre tech that I had worked with, um, Margie Coyman, she had gone with me to RAF Base Curtain to uh, do the work with FAST um, initially, all those years earlier. Um, Hayden Cohen, who he was another operating room uh, theatre technician, and uh, uh, Ross, um, Trish, and an army gentleman called Bubbles. Well, his name was Brandon, but we all used to call him Bubbles because he was such a happy little chappy. And the one thing about um, when you work with military medics and medicis is they don't need much supervision. They're very skilled, very talented people in their own right. So we went across and we, I, I was doing handover and they went into the wards to have a look. And we had two surgical wards and one big Florence Nightingale orthopaedic ward. It was huge, really long um, ward, old fashioned, like World War II kind of thing. And um, they'd sorted out where they were gonna work. And they told me, and I went, fine, you know, happy. And I'd done handover, takeover. And I remember a wonderful woman, uh, Major Todd, we, we did handover just outside of uh, uh, their church, their little church that they had. And she was telling me how she used to come over there when she was having a bad day and sit in the church. And that was all okay until in her next breath, she then said, oh yeah, and by the way, this was a siege of a big massacre where a whole lot of people had gone in seeking refuge and be killed. So I thought, I'm not stepping inside that door and I never did the whole entire time we were there. Anyway, um, these three uh, wards, very quickly that we were there, we realised that um, uh, they couldn't, they weren't functioning the way, to the best of their ability. And the orthopaedic ward, uh, you would go in and it would just smell horribly. And uh, the noise level was so awful. And we realised that the staff that were working there were not giving pain medication to the patients before they did and it was an orthopaedic ward, so there were lots of nasty wounds. And they weren't giving pain medication to the patients before they were doing dressing round. And antibiotics were given once a day, the whole 24 hours worth, rather than every four and six hours. So we had a lot of work to do to re-educate and help educate the staff that were there on better care. But we also thought that we realised that men and women in that culture didn't normally uh, were in the same areas together. So we, and they had infected patients with non-infected patients in the orthopaedic ward and children were intermingled with the adults and we had big frame beds and little beds and it was a nightmare. So we thought, okay, we're gonna rearrange these wards. So I went and spoke to all of the charge nurses and they all agreed. We went and spoke to the hospital administration and they said, yep, if you want to change the wards around, do that. Sounds like a good idea. But we needed physical people to do that. And I thought, shit, where are we going to get people that will actually physically move these patients? So I thought, well, maybe the infantry will help us. So I went over to speak to one of the, the lieutenants and, and the sergeants and I told them what we needed to do. But I said, I need people that will be able to physically move everyone. And they said, you want the infantry soldiers? You go ask them. So I went, okay. So down I went and I said, guys, next week, 
I know you've got days off and I need a hand. I said, I've got a job that needs to be done. I said, it's a real crappy job. It's heavy lifting, no joy in it whatsoever, but it will really help. And they said, what do you want? We'll do whatever you want. So anyway, um, they agreed. They said, yep, we explained what we were gonna do. They said, yep, piece of cake, we're off next week, we can help. So back I went. Two days later, we turn up. The whole Central Hospital Kigali had got people from I don't know where. People with mops, buckets, paintbrushes, um, clean linen for beds. Uh, they were there to clean the places as we were moving people and we're going, no, I don't have the infantry until next week. So I had to race over to uh, the barracks, find the team that were at rest and go in and go, guys, I'm in trouble, I need help. <laughs> and I need, I got a really bad job and they just went, what do you want us to do? And we went, oh, love you. And they came over. On their day off, they all came over and they helped and it was a really hot day and these guys had to physically you know move people from one ward to another and they were moving patients out and areas were being cleaned and painted and stuff and we couldn't put the patient back in so we had infantry soldiers with patients under trees and they were giving patients drinks out of their water bottles and looking after them and holding their hands you know we'd been in country less than three weeks at this stage and they were just amazing guys. And, um, and they stayed all day, helped us. And at the end of the day, we ended up with a female surgical ward, a male surgical ward, an orthopedic ward that had traction beds at one end, regular patients the other, children in the middle, infected patients one side, non-infected the other. And I, I just remember about a week after walking in with one of the, um, with one of the medics, um, John Harvey, and he and I walked into the orthopaedic ward and we both just stood there for a second and we looked at each other and I went, it smells different. And he said, there's no noise. And the difference that the impact of a simple thing that we had done had turned the whole way the nurses were starting to look after patients around. So even though we, we supplemented their staff and we were doing training and stuff, their nurses started to get their whole ethos back about what it was to be nurses and that it was okay to be a nurse because they'd had their self-esteem shot out of them. They'd had, um, they, were, they were terrified about showing their skills. And when they realised that we were actually there to help them and not to sort of take over from them, um, but to help guide them, get them back doing good things again, uh, they, they were happy and, uh, and they just rolled with it. Patients were getting medication before dressing rounds. They were getting their antibiotics when they needed and the difference that it made was fantastic. And that was a massive joint effort between Central Hospital Kigali, Osmed, the infantry. Um, we, you know, that was a, a huge achievement that very early on that uh, affected the whole thing. But we, um, I worked over there for a, a, a two and a half, nearly three months, and then went back over to the, um, uh, to the Osmed Hospital to allow other people to come and experience what we had experienced and that, that real sense of worth of, of working with people. Yeah, the medics used to, um, say that they you know that they've had one day off and all of a sudden everything's gone backwards and I, I'd sit down with them and I'd say well look you know you can't change the world you can't change Rwanda but we can do something for individuals and I said you might do two steps forward this week and one step backwards next week and two steps forward the week after but I said, if in our six months that we've been here, you can change a whole lot. So I said, look at the day by day, not the fact that you think suddenly something's gone backwards and do what we can for every person because that's what will make a difference in the long run. And, um, and they used to go, yeah, okay. And sometimes I'd sit back and you know, you would, you'd find here you are as a leader, they're always telling you, you're a leader, you've got to lead. 
you don't get a lot of real practice at doing that when you're doing your day-to-day -day job in the military and, and doctors, nurses, medics, we're all doing the same as if we were in a civilian hospital or a military hospital, but you've got other things that you do in the military as well. And a lot of that's really fun stuff. But here we are in a situation where no one taught us what to do. How do you build morale up with your team? And all you could do was try and use all your experiences and and all the things that have been said and done for you in your past and try and bring that together and keep people motivated. And it was not letting them feed on negativity because there was so much negativity going on, uh, you know, they, back where they were living. And I always used to say that if you hear a rumor, you come and tell me and I'll find out the truth and I'll tell you what the truth is because I don't want you feeding on negative things because our job's too important, what we're doing, um, to be filled with negative thoughts. So there's enough negative stuff going on. So I uh, went back onto the ward um, and uh, uh, doing day shifts, night shifts, and this particular time I was on night duty, um, I woke up and it was about five o'clock and I woke up in the afternoon and I thought something's not right. And it was just that sense and that feeling and the way people were talking and whispers and stuff. And I got out of bed and I opened up my door and I went out and I sort of looking around and I'm going, what's going on? And everyone's going, don't you know? And I'm going, no, hair's all over the place. I'm half dressed, half undressed because I've just got out of bed know what's going on and I was told that there had been this massacre at Cabello and I knew that we had sent a team out to Cabello. Whenever any of the, um, the camps were being dispersed, a medical team would go out and they would check people out before they were dispersed to go home. Well, it didn't quite work out that way for this particular group. This was a very, very large camp and had been left sort of to the last camp. And embedded in that camp, they believed, were the leftovers of the Intraharmway, who hadn't been able to get out of country, and they were embedded there. The RPA, the Rwandan Patriotic Army, went there because they wanted this camp dispersed. And if they couldn't disperse it, they would disperse it by eliminating the people that were there, which had been known to have happened in previous camps. So the Australians were being told to leave, to leave, to leave by the RPA and the um, Australian doctor, Carol Vaughan Evans, and the lieutenant that was there kept saying, we're not going, we have a job to do. We have a mandate by the UN. We're supposed to be here to do our job. And tensions were building and building and they'd been there a few days and then all of a sudden, one side of the camp, opened up fire on the other side of the camp and trapped right in the middle with the Australians. And they, and whilst the, the RPA were trying to fire on the intra harmway, they were mass killing civilians. So fathers, women, children, families, grandparents. And this was all happening right in front of the Australians and the Australians called back to the headquarters and said, we're taking fire, we're taking fire. And um, when the situation was discussed, it was decided that, well, the fire's not actually being directed on you, you're just in the middle of it, so you can't return fire. So unless somebody is firing directly at you, you cannot return fire. And anyway, who were they supposed to fire into? Because there was just this human shield of civilians between them and the army and the intra Um So they all hit the dirt. And for a very short period of time, headquarters back in Kigali had no idea whether their people on the ground were alive or dead. Because as everything started getting closer to them, you know, rounds were, you know, people would hit the dirt, but rounds were falling at head level at people on the ground. Um, and I, you know, the story that Robbie Lucas tells of him turning around and just watching bullets and he's waiting for them to get closer and closer to him and finally till one hit him, but thank God no one was hurt. But all of these people hit the ground and then they're hanging on at headquarters going, what do we do? 
because they didn't know if their people were alive or dead. And then about 10 or so minutes later, um, the, the infantry lieutenant gets back on and sort of says, well, you know, we're all live. Uh, this is going on. Can we return fire? Can we return fire? Because these people are being slaughtered in front of them. And part of your charter is that you don't allow that to happen. But once again, who do you fire at? Where, where is all of this coming from? So with all of this, UN headquarters gets involved. They start sending in um, the other infantry units from the, um, uh, the African units that are nearby. They all start streaming in. Uh, and the whole thing then is just an absolute massacre. Um, the, the RPA stopped firing, but uh, then the medical team literally just start, you know, people are just coming in with massive, huge wounds, being shot. The infantry are going out trying to drag people that are alive in, and over a period of a couple of weeks, um, people are evacuated out of there, and mass graves were just dug, and people were just buried by the tens of thousands. And these are people that believe that they were safe in a camp. You're only safe so long as the government will allow that to happen. But Australian soldiers um, and medical teams stayed on the ground the whole time, treating, uh, treating people and dealing with the aftermath of what happened. Um, I remember our, uh, our SAS medical warrant officer saying a couple of years later, he was asked to go back because uh, he was fairly quickly on the ground with a lot of a whole lot of other people uh, to help coordinate what was going on. And he had to go back and he was flying in a helicopter over the area because the RPA was saying it never happened. And the International Tribunal um, were trying to say, well, it did happen and this is where it happened and they needed to dig up bodies and try and find. And he said, you went over the area in Cabello and they had done something like five big pits where all these bodies were just pushed into. And he said you could tell the pits because the land was all vacant except five big rectangular areas with corn growing out of it. And this was the corn that the people had eaten that were growing up out of the ground from within their gut. So it's really horrendous. And when you think that he then went around and did that, and you know, these people, this camp was so bad that people were going around, because corn is something that doesn't break down too easily, and they were finding food in faeces to eat, because that's, and the Australians were witness to all of that. That kind of depravity and, non, I don't even know how to describe it. How do you turn on another human being like that? And, and it, it made me realise that, you know, there was Rwanda, a country that was covered, had paved roads everywhere. It owed no one any money. It, it was self-sufficient. It was a country that worked beautifully together, turned on itself. So what's that to stop us from doing the same thing? And I think that's something I know I struggled with for years, thinking there's a country that it should never have happened to, and who's to say it can't happen to us? So, you know, there's a lot of... Um, and, and although I wasn't on the ground in Cabello, um, I'm really glad I wasn't on the ground. And as horrible as that may seem, because fellow people that I know that were on the ground, suffered with all of that and the things that they had to see and do. Um, it's an awful thing to say, but I am so glad that I, I didn't have to experience that. It was bad enough back on the ward when I woke up that day, I got changed, I went, I grabbed something to eat because I thought I don't think I'm going to be eating tonight because I know that all these evacuees had come in to us to, for surgery and we were looking after patients all night that should have been in the ICU. And I'll just tell you one little quick story of getting hand over, take over and going around and, and all of a sudden realising in this room that there's something moving in this bed. 
and I go over to this bed and there's a baby in it. And I'm thinking, crap, <laughs> where'd this baby come from? And, and the baby belonged to a mother who had a massive chest wound um, and she was being operated on. So all of a sudden I went from one patient to two and we had to remember we had this baby so that I, I found an infantry soldier and said, here, would you uh, change this baby and feed it? Because they used to love that. Um, and just look after this baby for a while because I just physically don't have any hands. And trying to, you know, they let us sleep when the chaos happened because they knew that they would need to send people to sleep and have a new team come on and take over. And, you know, we didn't lose anybody. No one died. If they came out of the operating theatre alive from that event, they lived. Um, and some of those people were pretty messed up and some of those kids were so badly shot up. Um, there was a child that arrested in a helicopter and they had to resus him in the helicopter and he got to the theatre and re uh, arrested a couple of times and that kid walked out of there. Um, a young teenage lad that had a massive chest wound, um, he walked out of there. This woman with her baby walked out of there. So, you know, even though we, the surgeons were brilliant, the, the medical staff, the, the nurses, the medics, the doctors that were there, just awesome. So, you know, for those people that we were able to help, um, once again, individuals that we were able to help, was just fantastic. There's, there's, a little, there's a picture of a little girl out there, actually, um, which I'll scan in and send to you. But she, um, one of our doctors saw her walking around. She was a child of a patient at Central Hospital Kigali. She was walking around on her toes with one foot. And the RPA used to, uh, to get rid of children, they would spray the ground with, um, with bullets which would fragment and all of um, and it would shoot off these this little pieces of shrapnel and it would get in the back of the kid's legs and as soon as you get a foreign body in a Achilles tendon it shrinks this Achilles tendon and these kids would be walking around on their toes. Well one of the doctors saw her when he went over to do rounds at one time and they, he spoke to the physio and the physio said yeah yeah well we need to do we'll put her in a plaster if you can remove the shrapnel and they spoke to her parents and the parents signed a consent and she came over one day and the surgeons painstakingly removed the shrapnel out of her Achilles tendon, sewed it all back up. She woke up in plaster and the physio did all the exercises and stuff and the picture of her out there is her with the walking frame. But um, within six to eight weeks, she was walking like a normal kid again, helping an individual. That's, that's all we could do when we were there. That's all you could do. Yeah. And did you know about the young lad? There was a kid in one of the camps. I don't know if you'd heard this story, but there was a kid in one of the camps that um, uh, one of the infantry soldiers gave him some chocolate and, uh, and the, the infantry soldiers would play with them all the time. You know, they'd play soccer or whatever um, with these kids. And this kid to himself thought, I want to be like that. I want to do that. And that child grew up, convinced his family to come to Australia. They emigrated to Australia. And he is an infantry soldier in the Australian infantry. And he came and spoke to us at the, when we um, received the meritorious unit citations. Um, and that was given to the contingents combined and individually. It's the first time the government's ever done it. So we won them as an individual, which is why we can wear them as well as the contingent, because we didn't belong to a unit. It wasn't just a unit that went over. Yeah, and he came and spoke to us there and said it was the kindness of an Australian soldier that got him through that experience and made him want to be a soldier so that he can do that for someone else.